But I listened to you talk to Chuck Johnson. Of course, it was about me and Fuentes and all that stuff. Um, what's your lay of the land on that? If you want to weigh in on that, um, uh, I feel like I've just looked. I, I feel like I can look at Fuentes objectively in a way because I don't have anything at, at stake with him. Um, it, you know, back in 2017, it was kind of like Fuentes versus Spencer and, uh, and, in, a, in a very major way. There, there are other factors involved, but I, I, I think, you know, the optics war and, all, all, you know, what, about, what do we think about Charlottesville, et cetera? I think a lot of that is water under the bridge, and, and I can just look at him objectively. I don't have anything at stake with him, so I don't vehemently hate him. I don't want to join his movement, and I feel like I can criticize him objectively and, and, and accurately. Um, he came on to the scene as this conservative kid who I think was getting some traction among conservatives, and he wanted, he was obviously pro-Trump at some, you know, he still is now, but he was very pro-Trump at some point, even though he, he had been anti-Trump, I think, when he was in high school or some crazy thing like that. Um, and he wanted to move the alt-right away from being the alt-right, that is, away from being an alternative right and to being a kind of hyper-conservative, you know, hard right, we love Trump, we take no prisoners kind of thing. And I think he successfully did that. I mean, he successfully won that war. And I think he, in a weird way, successfully won the Graper War in the sense that, uh, you know, TPUSA, Charlie Kirk, Marjorie Taylor Greene were kind of stealing his talking points. Uh, I guess, as we learned today, literally hiring Graipers. And, and uh, basically just, they, they didn't, there was no more division between the Graipers and mainstream conservatives because the conservatives took it all on. They're anti-vaccine, they're uh, stop the steal, they're Trump is our Jesus, et cetera, et cetera. And so he, in a way, won all of those battles even as he got increasingly pushed out. Um, now, I noticed this in 2020. I noticed this before then. I certainly noticed this now. There were these really bad characters involved yeah, i mean there, there were bad characters involved in the alt right there were bad characters involved in, in all sorts of things but that linking up with ali alexander or i mean putting aside accusations of grooming and nude photos with 15 year olds or something just just putting even putting that aside he he is a really bad person and character like there's no way that this car does not crash. You know, we, there's no way this movie does not end in a Viking bonfire. There's just no other option when you're dealing with someone that despicable to be frank. And so I, you know, I looked at that. I thought that was a, a dangerous situation. Uh, getting involved with J6 to the degree to which he did. Now, he has not faced any no. uh, criminal issues as of yet. He very well might. Uh, other Grapers have who enter the Capitol. Poor Riley, you know, is inspired to engage in international espionage and is now in jail for the duration. Uh, so he really, he went from this like weird, cute, I guess, kind of conservative kid who wanted to reform the alt-right and, and make it not about being, uh, make it not about white nationalism per se, and um, kind of move it towards mainstream GOP stuff. And he ends up influencing the GOP to a, to a strong degree. But he, but he also ends up in this kind of point of desperation. And in some ways, I gained some respect for Fuentes because he became genuinely radical, maybe even genuinely insane. I mean, I don't want to join his movement. And I don't it's not me. It goes against things that I actually care about. But like calling for the death of the enemies of Jesus, that is very bold. And it is a it also is a kind of sign of just crossing a Rubicon. I mean, there's no return from that. Uh, it might be rhetoric on some level. I mean, he's not like actually calling for someone's death but it's so bold there's just no way of coming back there's no way for nick to be this cute conservative kid on live streams anymore he he's crossed something he, he he's 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 over into the other side and 
even though I don't support it, I, I kind of, I don't know, have, have a certain weird respect for his crazy boldness. Well, um, that, that's kind of my take on it. It's my honest take. Right. I mean, again, in terms of the accusations with Al Akbar, it doesn't surprise me at all. And needless to say, I, I vehemently reject all of that shit. Uh, but that, that's not the entire story of Fuentes in my mind. All right. Now you're, you switched in and out of roboting there, but it came back and now it's roboting a little bit again. So I, it might fix itself. Uh, so let's just hope that it, it fixes itself. It did. And I didn't I stop you. Do just the computer. I could take these things off. That might be better. Okay. Um, I'm not sure why it's doing that, but I don't think it's on my end. It's, it's just something with the audio and that happens sometimes. Do you hear me now? Yes, yes, that sounds so much better. Yeah, yeah, that sounds so much better. Um, so, and I, I'm going to try to stay objective here. I think you know, and you've seen some of the things I've said and and put out there. So, but I'm I've got my uh, interviewer hat on, so I'm going to try to stay objective. Why do you think? Because you know, I, I would argue that he. First off, I would argue that those talking points uh, that you pointed out there don't help. Uh, anti-Zionism, basically, um, that they actually are kind of a detriment, uh, really. They, because... they reinforce <laughs> the case for Zionism. There's right, no that's what I'm saying, right? When you say yeah. shit like that, it doesn't, it makes it very easy to caricature you and the people around you, and that's the type of things they want to hear, quite frankly, right? Um, and so, you know, I made that point as well, but why do you think, because he used to be, I would argue, smarter with his rhetoric. Uh, and, you know, you talked about the optics war. Well, I mean, that's kind of out the window when you're, uh, you know, doing Holy saluting on death. Rumble. Yeah, it's, it's holy wars. The enemies and, of Christ on this planet. I mean, right. yeah, the optics are kind of out the window. But, like, the optics war was always bullshit on some right. level. You know, the people who promoted the optics war were, like, Andrew Anglin and Weave and, and, and TRS to some degree and, and, and Nick Fuentes. And none of those people can ever get away from the fact that to maintain their audience, they have to do some crazy baiting at some point. You know, so it's like, I can't believe that people are, the Wignats are criticizing Donald Trump, but we need to put our faith, trust the plan and put our faith in Donald Trump and he'll kill the Jews or something. Like it, it was always a weird, like double move or double talk. It was, it was always pretty shambolic. But yeah, at, at this point, obviously, it, it's just totally water under the bridge. I mean, but again, I, I do have a certain respect for Christian fundamentalist and fundamentalist of all kinds. I mean, you can criticize them in many ways, but you kind of can't say they're, they don't have principles. And it, it is, I mean, I think the United States is, is actually headed for something bad. I, I think there's going to be a major backlash. I, I, I think this, I know this sounds hysterical. I, I think this might very well be our like last election in 2024. And Nick is giving voice to that extremism i guess that that kind of radical quality like what he's doing is weirdly authentic even if again it's something that i personally re reject and would personally advise people to get a, as far away from it as they can and to kind of rethink their life and so on it is kind of authentic kind of in, in the way that like isis is authentic <laughs> and isis and groipers there's a lot of similarities the incels the kind of like I can't get pussy. I'm not valued in the society. My life sucks. Understandable. And so I'm going to jump in, take this leap of faith into radical extremism. I mean, it, it's a common story, in fact, and it is weirdly authentic and principled, even if it, it is not a, a, attractive and it's going to lead towards, I mean, you can't say the shit and then say like, oh, we're going to also like, um, you know, when in the primaries next year. So, I mean, once you call for the death of the enemies of God, like you have, you know, tossed your dice and it's all or nothing. Now, let That's, me, uh, let me ask yeah. you, you talk about principled and, you know, I, I have my, I don't know, uh, because like, is it principled or is he using shock comments to, to try to draw more of an audience or draw more people to him? Because he used to not 
say stuff like this. Now, I don't know if he believed it then or right. Maybe he did. You know, it's very possible. But um, it, it just seems to be um, a pretty radical shift in his public presentation over the last two years. Uh, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on why that might have occurred or, like, just what the game I think plan he is there. feels alienated. And, yeah. you know, like, I felt that way, too, particularly immediately after Charlottesville getting – demonetized and deplatformed in so many ways and you feel alienated from society and i think his his followers feel alienated not not to the degree that he is like they they're still on twitter to a large degree or they, they don't have banking issues or whatever but as young incels and just even young people that they don't know what they can do with their life and they don't feel like there's a path that's immediately available to them they're kind of inherently alienated. I mean, it really is the ISIS strategy. I mean, the I, and I'm I'm not trying to say this to like be a an asshole and and you know diss him or something like that. I don't you know I'm I'm being honest. Like the amount of people who joined ISIS who were like early twenties guys whacked out of their mind watching pornography on the internet, et cetera. That that was like the main contingent. It wasn't a bunch of like 70 year old men with beards reading the Quran. It was a bunch of like alienated teenagers who were like, I have nothing to lose. I have absolutely nothing. Life sucks. Might as well become a radical fundamentalist for the walls. I mean, that's true. What you say about that's true. And, I, you know, I never really thought about it from that perspective. But, yeah, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head uh, with that analysis. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these are disaffected young men. I've been there myself. Uh, yeah. And, you know, in some ways still I am disaffected. Uh, but, you know, I... And I got some questions, by the way. Super chat your questions in. I'll ask all those. I'll go to those next. Uh, so I haven't forgot about you guys. I'll ask the questions. But um, I guess I just don't see where it goes uh, from here, like anywhere productive. And, it goes and towards violence. I mean, there's no other possible way where it goes other than that, or it fizzles out. But the thing is, we're about to experience an existential election. You know, like there is a guy who I have never even heard of who's apparently running for president called like Heard or something. And he spoke at an Iowa gathering of Republicans and he was like, let me shoot you straight here, boys. You know, Donald Trump's not running for president because he loves y'all in America. He's trying to stay out of prison. And not wrong, I guess. <laughs> but uh, I mean, other elections... You know, everyone says, like, this is the most important election of your lifetime. They constantly say that. I've heard that since, like, the year 2000 or in the 90s or whatever. Now, it really is win this election or death or prison. And that is the, that is the state that Donald Trump is in. It is that existential. So he can win election and pardon himself, presumably, or call off the DOJ, appoint a crony as the... Um, you know, uh, attorney general, I, I don't know what he's going to do, but there, there's a, if he wins, he can certainly get out of these criminal cases. I don't think the civil cases matter at all. He could just, you know, whatever he owes millions to someone who cares. Um, it's the criminal cases where he could actually face jail time or house arrest for the duration of his life. I mean, I, it's just horrible shit. And so he needs to win or he is going to die. And that existential quality radiates out to the entire election where all of his followers you're not just voting for tax cuts or like a new border wall it's it's the stakes have been raised to this point of existential angst are you going to live or die and so i've tried i've been trying to talk myself out of this position because it does seem hysterical you could say but I, I wonder if this is the last election, like the amount and not, not even just the grapers, put them aside, the amount of mainstream conservatives who might go absolutely nuts if Trump loses. And on the left, Trump could win the 2024 election. There's just no doubt. Like he, he is over 50 percent in the Republican primaries. He's got that in the bag, more or less. He who knows what happens with the economy, or Ukraine, et cetera. He could win. I mean, I don't think I I wouldn't bet on it, but there's probably like a five percent or ten percent chance that he could win, and then I think the left would actually go through their own like existential crisis, and uh, engage in rioting and insurrection. I I don't know. So like th this is where we are, and I kind of I almost want to talk myself out of this opinion or like talk America off the ledge 
but I don't think I can. Like, I, I genuinely think we are in an emergency, basically, and there's no way out of it. And every time you push, it, there's like an equal opposite re reaction. So it's like Jack Smith, he has more indictments. There's going to be an indictment in Georgia, reportedly, later on in August. You keep pushing these things and you keep saying, this is just about law and order. This is just about you know, free and fair elections, et cetera. And they keep pushing back. They're like, look, they're prosecuting him more. They hate him more. They don't ever want him to be president because he's going to end the evil deep state but once and for all. It, it just, everything they do makes the stakes higher and higher and higher. And at some point, you just can't talk yourself down off the ledge. So I know I sound hysterical, but I, my objective, rational opinion is that we are headed for some sort of disaster in 2024. <laughs> so, and again, I'll wrap up the, the Fuentes portion. I'm not trying to bait you. Uh, yeah. I think you've given a, a fair analysis here. Um, but, but you see him as kind of existing in that milieu, uh, you know, yeah. uh, and, and America first existing in that. Do you see any way? And, and again, I don't obviously, I, you know, preface this with I don't see any way for Nick Fuentes to come to power or America first to come to power. Uh, but if you look at their rank and file members, they do. Uh, they do think that and they say it often that he's going to be president or dictator or whatever king uh and that this i mean it's laughable right like i don't know i think it's laughable um yeah. but what what do you think about it and um and, and i'll wrap the fuentes section because we got some other stuff to talk about too but well i look i don't think that's going to happen but i do think that the mainstream right will continue to steal his energy so they're, the mainstream right is going to continue to, to alienate Nick Fuentes. They're going to continue to push him while they continue to repeat his talking points. You know, I mean, like, yes, Nick called for the enemies of God on this planet to cease to exist. But like Marjorie Taylor Greene has called for a national divorce. I mean, that, that's a pleasant way of saying secession and the breakup of the United States. That's serious talk. Michael Knowles, who's this like, you know, funny... Uh, uh, ben Shapiro lackey called for effectively trans genocide. I mean, I don't, he, he said we want to abolish transgenderism. He said that at CPAC. Now, again, they're going to, there, he needs to find a way to differentiate himself from the conservatives who hate him. And his only way to do that is to kind of like keep going further. I think that even a sort of anti Semitism will become prominent among mainstream conservatives. And they're going to basically, it's going to be the kind of rootless cosmopolitan line about, you know, the, 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 they're part of the deep state or George Soros, or they're secretly Nazis, or they're, they're, they're not real Americans. They're not Christians. It, there's going to be some kind of insinuation of anti-Semitism on the mainstream, right? So they're, they're going to continue to take Nick Fuentes' talking points while they push him away. So I don't think he has any path in the mainstream, right? Now, might the Groypers just totally go insane if Trump loses and like actually become ISIS or like actually do something? I think that's possible, to be honest. I mean, it's like you when you say things out loud and you make claims. Yeah, sure. A lot. It can often be bullshit. I, I, I've made claims that are kind of bullshitty. You know, it, it, it can often be bullshit. But if you keep saying it over and over and over again, you keep convincing yourself of something, at some point it's going to be real for you and you're going to do something about it. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think we're in an extreme situation, basically. Well, you're talking about ISIS and this and that. And, you know, um, if you study like the history of uh, suicide bombers uh, and stuff like that, uh, Palestine, other places, um, Usually it's disaffected males, right? With uh, they feel like they have nowhere to go, uh, they yeah. feel like they have no future, no path, and then they go. They're not getting pussy, bomb. right? Huh? That's I mean that's fucking it. That's fuck. Oh, you can talk about career options and things like that. It's about not getting pussy. I think so too. And you, see, yeah. you see, it. it's <laughs> crazy, Richard. I don't know. Um, you know. I, I hate to be vulgar, but go buy a whore. Like at a certain point, like I mean, you're you're losing your mind, right? Like because you can't get yeah. pussy. Like I don't know, there's something you know uh, wrong there. Um, there are other methods to break the ice or something, right? Uh, but you see it though, uh, and they're really pissed off about it. Uh, and you said it yourself earlier in the interview. I mean, there really is 
nowhere else for it to lead uh, if it keeps going this way unless it either fizzles out or people start blowing shit up uh, or doing other things. Um, yeah. Do you think that's a possibility? I think you already said that, but. Yes. Yeah. Someone, I think, asked in a super chat. Yeah, and I'm about to go through if, those next. Yeah, go ahead. Give Ralph advice on destroying America first. I mean, again, just <laughs> no. leave it alone, I, I think, at this point. I mean, its trajectory is towards uh, a car accident. Well, I think I picked the, the right time to disassociate. Let's put it that way. Uh, and yeah. it happened to be right before and right, you know, I was out in the parking lot trolling them and revealed where the the, the rally was and all that. Now, I didn't know what he was going to say at that rally, by the way. Uh, you know, this was kind of a personal thing that uh, that escalated. And, you know, it's been more than that since. But yeah. uh, I definitely think I picked the right time, uh, unsuspectingly, because you hear that speech, and you know, I didn't even hear what he said till I got back home, and it's just like, man, what in the fuck? Uh, yeah, you know, I, you know, I should say I have a certain sympathy. I, I, I sympathize with someone who has become desperate, who's been kind of beaten down. I, I do have sympathy for him. I, I had sympathy for uh, Riley Williams, who was a griper, uh, you know, partisan, and. She, you know, she was kind of like a female incel, a femme cell, uh, you know, on, on some level from what I could tell. And she, you know, it's like, how did I get here? I was just this like cute girl from the East Coast. And next thing I know, I've stolen Nancy Pelosi's laptop and I'm trying to sell it to Russia. <laughs> you know, I'm engaged in international <laughs> espionage of the highest degree, at least potentially. And you know, I don't know. I, I, I obviously I would advise anyone to get out of that situation and rethink their life and, and, and more. And I don't advocate it, but I have a certain sympathy for the desperate radical, like in, 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 in that point of committing a crime, even he or she is almost true to him or herself, you know, like they, they, they've crossed a Rubicon. They've taken a step where they can never go back. And again, without, I'm not condemning them nor endorsing them. I don't want to be around such people, but they are, they've achieved a certain authenticity in their life. And I have a certain weird respect for that. All right. And I appreciate the fair and balanced take. You know, I knew you would bring that by the way. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, let me go through some of these questions, by the way. Thank you for watching this clip. This is the CACA Lofer. Remember to like and subscribe.